Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Gail Blevins, the head coach of the University of Iowa women's softball team, is talented and greatly admired. To put it simply, and I quote, the nation's best is at Iowa, Gail Blevins. Gail's coaching record is remarkable. She came to Iowa in 1987, and during her second year on the job, the women's softball team won the Big Ten championships and traveled to the NCAA finals a first for Iowa. Since her arrival, her teams have won three Big Ten titles, been in the Big Ten tourney since its beginning, had nine NCAA regional appearances, and played in the World Series three out of the last four years. Only eight teams in the country go to the World Series. In the spring of 1997, she posted her 300th Iowa victory and her 600th career win. She was the NFCA National Coach of the Year twice, Mideast Region Coach of the Year six times, and Big Ten Conference Coach of the Year two times. Before coming to Iowa, Blevins had a successful career at Indiana University. Besides coaching, she served as a six-year member of the National Softball Committee and as the first vice president of the National Softball Coaches Association. She believes in giving back to the community and encourages her players to do so too. Their commitments include Special Olympics, a visiting nursing home, Habitat for Humanity, and the Christian Appalachian Project. Gail received her undergraduate degree from the University of Dayton and her master's at Indiana University. Welcome, Gail, to One of a Kind. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Your story, I know, begins in Kentucky in 1952 and then you moved to Ohio, and you thought that was quite courageous on your father's part. Tell me about this. Well, you know, at the time when you're a young, young child, you don't realize the moves and, and why your parents make moves. But in having information shared as I became a young adult, I realized how difficult it was for a traditional Southern family to move away from family. But realizing that the opportunities were very limited, not only for my father for employment, but for us as, as the, the, the siblings, he knew it was the time and the place and opportunity for us to move to another part of the country where we'd have more opportunity for us. So tell me how your parents influenced you, Gail. Uh, I, you know, I, I think about that every day. I can see it in, in everything that I do. Um, certainly my work ethic and my values are a reflection of my parents and uh, as they are for all my brothers and sisters and grand, the grandkids in the family. Um, uh, loyalty and honesty and integrity, I think, are things that my mom and dad personified every day of my life, have always. Mm -hmm. And I'm real fortunate to have them both in my life, and uh, they continue to be a, a great role model. And I bet they are big fans and come here a lot to see your team play? They are very big fans. In fact, uh, the Blevins household <laughs> travels at least as a group, <coughs> not just mom and dad, but at least on one occasion in one of the Big Ten season games. And my team always comments that it's a rather unique weekend when the Blevins household is around. Now, are we, we're talking more than your parents. Do we have siblings coming? Yes, I have, I have uh, four brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and between them we have 12 children, grandchildren in the family. And so all my nieces and nephews crawling under the bleachers, over the top, wherever they might be, <laughs> on the field afterwards to meet the mm -hmm. young women. So it's a, a very loud and vocal and supportive Blevins clan. Great. Now, what kind of sports were available for you to play in high school? Interestingly enough, not much, uh, at least where I was in Dayton, Ohio at the time. Mm -hmm. Volleyball, believe it or not, fencing, gymnastics. That was it. And fencing. so, fencing, yes, I can remember doing fencing just to get in shape mm -hmm. for volleyball. But, uh, and gymnastics was not quite my cup of tea, so I did not partake there. But uh, at the time and the location where I was at, there really weren't a lot of opportunities for young girls. Hmm. So when did you get into softball? That became a summer activity uh -huh. and having access to an ASA team but not until college. 
And um, once I was in college, my primary sport in college actually was volleyball. But I went to a very small college, so I had the opp opportunity to play volleyball, basketball, softball, and, and ten tennis all at the same time. Uh, so you kind of traveled from one sports season to another. Mm -hmm. But softball became a greater reality in the summer as I was in college. Now, when you graduated from college, you uh, became a teacher. Tell That's me correct. about this and how you got into coaching. Yes, I did. I, I went into the secondary level and taught for five years in uh, uh, a sub <coughs> subdivision of Dayton, Ohio, in, in Mad River Township. And uh, I, I think it was a wonderful experience. I wouldn't trade those five years for anything that I've done professionally because I learned a lot about myself as a young person and maybe literally being two years older than some of the youngest, the older students that I had. Uh, that was a great experience. And yet, as I was teaching, I found myself searching for maybe a little more of an opportunity on the coaching mm -hmm. side of things and thought that probably in all likelihood I would need to go back to school and pursue my master's and look for an opportunity at the collegiate level, mm -hmm. which is what I was able to do. So then you went off to, to get your master's at Indiana. Yes, I, uh, I received a teaching assistantship, actually went there on a teaching assistantship and took a sabbatical for a year, mm -hmm. thinking I would probably return. And little did I know that my principal was smarter than I, and he knew he, I would not return. He, he knew. He, he, he did he tell me that. He was saying goodbye to you for, for good. He knew that at uh -huh. the time. And I was very fortunate that I had some opportunities in the uh, Indiana University Athletic Department, mm -hmm. and, and in particular with the softball program as an assistant coach that first year, too. And, and everything that has happened is, is a direct result of that experience. So you were an assistant coach, and then the, the head coach left? Or, yes. And well, actually, the positions, um, this would have been back in 1978. Many of the positions were joint positions at that time. So athletics was just beginning to kind of take off in terms of more full-time positions for women. And so many of the positions were split off instead of coaches being dual sport coaches. And I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. And you were there how long? I uh, was a head coach at Indiana for eight years. What went into your decision to come to Iowa? Well, Christine Grant was a big part of that decision. And having competed at Iowa, having competed against the Iowa program, having observed the community and the kind of support, um, I, there was a, a special mystique about Iowa. And I, I knew the kind of support, and I know what Christine had, had done to that point and continues to do. And it was, it was very appealing to consider coming here and, 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 and knowing I would have that type of support and following. Mm -hmm. She's in the forefront, isn't she, in, in the United States about getting colleges and universities to support women's programs. Absolutely. We just had, as a matter of fact, this weekend, our 25th year reunion uh, of women's athletics. And it was a wonderful banquet. And um, uh, Peg Burke shared a lot of the history of sport opportunities for women at the university. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you, you can sit there and understand even more just listening to the history of which Christine is a huge, huge part. Well, and then I read this um, quote of Mary Sue Coleman, President Coleman, and I, let me just read this. She said, as the first public university in the United States to admit women and men on an equal basis, the university has an ongoing commitment to equal opportunity. In the 90s, we made a public commitment to achieving gender equity in sports, end yes. quote. And is that quite unusual for universities across the nation? Well, I, I suppose when you think you have to legislate in order to make it be a norm, mm -hmm. to me it would say, yes, it is. And that's what has had to happen in order to bring some people into compliance mm -hmm. versus it choosing to be an, a choice on the university par university's part. Mm -hmm. It's a choice at Iowa, and that's nice that we have that kind of an environment. When you're recruiting, do you like to recruit? Oh, is yes, that, yes. Is that w one of the bennies of your job, is, is kind of going out to visit different young women throughout the country? I think the relationships are the, are the integral part that you really enjoy about mm -hmm. uh, recruiting. Even the students that you're not fortunate enough to recruit, I will see them and I'll see, or I'll see their parents years after we've had a chance to have actually recruited them and they're playing maybe even elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we still have, I think, a very positive relationship mm -hmm. with them. So the relationships are the fun part. When, aside from talent being just a darn good ball player, what do you look for in your recruits? Well, I think what's unique about Iowa students is that, yes, obviously there has to be a, a commitment in terms of talent, or an ability in terms of talent. There has to be a commitment to the academics. And so those are the two givens up front. But then we go beyond that. And I, I believe there are two qualities that distinguish the young women that we take, and that's heart 
and desire. Those mm -hmm. are the two things that we look at. And quite often, Ellen, sometimes it may not be the very first pick, the very first student that will jump out at you that we will decide is the student that we want for Iowa. Mm -hmm. But once we have a chance to get to know the student and we see the kind of desire and heart and uh, commitment that they make, that helps us make a decision that this is someone right for us. Hmm. When your, um, my research assistant told me that she'd love to sit in on some of your practices because you, you, you motivate your kids so well, how do you do it? What do you, what do you tell them and uh, what? Um, well, I, I, again, I think it starts with what you start with in a person. And uh, the, the people that have the great heart and drive have an inner motivation. Mm -hmm. And there may be days where maybe they struggle, as we all do, um, but we remind them of, of why they may have chosen to come to Iowa or what's important to them. And I think when you find the right people, and you, the key is first to surround yourself with, with really good people, mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think that the motivation is easy because there's a personal intrinsic motivation. And those are the kinds of young women that I want. And those are the kinds of wo young women that we search very hard to find. But you're also looking for a team player. Absolutely, yes. And in our program, <laughs> when, you're, when you're dealing with numbers of students, um, we're a sport that plays nine at a time. We obviously have more than nine in our program. Mm -hmm. You have to have people that are committed to the whole of the group. Uh, we use an analogy with our team of, uh, of being like a flock of geese, and I'm sure that my students will laugh to hear that I've <laughs> shared this with you, but in so many ways we are just like that because everybody in our program has a chance to lead at some point in time and the energy of the entire group is what allows the group to move as far as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So if we can get everyone to understand that she has an important role within our program, some may not be as big a role as, as another student, mm -hmm. but they're all very critical roles and, and allow mm -hmm. us to be successful, I think then we, we get our students to move in a good direction. And they finally come around and are pulling together. It's, it's interesting. Our society stresses a great deal about the individual, and mm -hmm. we spend so much time trying to build the concept of a family, and a family cares. And, and as my parents have done for me, at times we sacrifice for one another, mm -hmm. and you do it for the good of the family or for your team. And uh, I think that's an important concept for any group of people to learn. You've had a lot of successes, like I uh, said in the introduction of you. Do you have one or two that just are so, so sweet and so special? I, I don't think you'll ever forget the first time you help someone experience something for the first time. My second year here, the group that I had was largely the same group that I had inherited the year before. Mm -hmm. We maybe had two uh, additional recruits that year, but the fun thing was to see the growth and the change attitudinally in the group that, re that returned. And then we went from first year of being fifth in the conference to first. So that was fun. That was real fun. And it was fun to see what happened with those young women. Mm -hmm. And that's something they're very proud of. Many of them were just back for this reunion that we had last weekend, this past weekend. And then, of course, going to the World Series the very first time and being a major underdog. Those are fun yeah. things because no one would have given us an even possible consideration. I'm sure the oddsman would have had a heyday <laughs> on that one. But uh, it's fun to take people through something that they've never, ever experienced before. You, say, you tell your, uh, your recruits and your players that success is a journey. T comment yes. on this. Well, I, I think so often, especially in sport, we can be so caught up in the final outcome. And yet there are so many measuring sticks along the way that mm -hmm. indicate that people are successful. If that weren't the case, then everybody who was short of being the national champion would have been a failure in a, in a given season. And that mm -hmm. just is not the case. Um, the years where we've maybe not even been close to winning the Big Ten Championship might have been some of the most successful experiences that we've had because we took people, we went a lot further than people might have predicted we may have gone. What we did last year was remarkable. We had six new starters. We had a major, what many would have called a rebuilding year, and yet we were right back in the NCAA tournament again and second in the Big Ten Championship in the Big Ten Tournament. Mm -hmm. And I consider that a very successful journey in light of the fact that we had so many new and young students. Mm -hmm. So I think if we we, we spend so much time focusing on the process of getting better and of, of developing, mm -hmm. and I think that has to be the measuring stick more than just the final outcome. And do you feel like some people that they've learned more from some failures than they have their successes? But I don't know, reading your bio and your, the, uh, the, the information on you, you have not had many failures in your coaching career. 
But, you know, any coach will tell you they'll remember those before they will remember <laughs> <Right>. the other. <laughs> but I think that's very true. You have, to, you have to stumble and you have to crawl sometimes to learn how to, to make the next mm -hmm. step. And we say this all the time right now in practice. We're in a very early stage of our practice that our students can't be worried about failing because failing is also the, the, step, the first step of, of becoming successful. And, and not to be afraid to venture out, mm -hmm. to not to be afraid to step out on the limb or to take the risk. And, and um, that's, that's all part of the success. Mm -hmm. Now, I read also that uh, quite a few of your players have gone on to be coaches. Yes, they have. Now, yes. I'm not sure what that says. If it I says, I, I think I can do it better and show, all, <laughs> show coach how, <laughs> I I, that's how to it do it. It must please you. Well, it does. It really does, especially when they come back and explain why uh -huh. they have chosen to go into coaching. And um, I, I think that I, it helps me to feel good to think they had a, a positive experience mm -hmm. and they're taking from that and choosing to make a profession for themselves. And so, yes, it's exciting because I consider teaching and coaching to be um, a very valuable profession because we have a chance to impact so many young people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, some of the most valuable people in my life have been teachers. And if I can do for other students what many people have done for me, then I've, I've had a very lovely life. Tell me about these teachers that have influenced you. I can go all the way back to elementary school and have some vivid, vivid memories. I was a first generation child in my family to go to college. And so the university environment and opportunity was, a, is, is very, was very foreign to my mom and dad. And if it weren't really at that point in time for some support from teachers and encouragement to say this is something that you really need to, to start thinking about, who knows where I might be today? Mm -hmm. It's hard to know. And so I can go back to el early elementary teachers that I had, uh, Mr. Pete Lanesa and Mrs. Nelson and a number of people. I can look back at people that influenced me in, in my high school, Joe Stewart, Mary Jo Stewart. Uh, a number of people who encouraged me with looking at opportunities for scholarships, knowing that it would be a difficult financial burden mm -hmm. for my family, but recognizing that this was something that professionally I, I should be a part of. And I, again, and you listen to them. I mean, that's the amazing thing. That's that's the, they at just that were age. people I absolutely dearly loved, and still do. And um, to be a young person to have a sixth and seventh grade teacher talking to you along these lines, and then to go to high school and to have in 10th grade and 11th grade and 12th grade to have people along the way who kept directing and kept mm -hmm. leading. Uh, I needed that, as all young people do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I think that you know, it, was, it was wonderful that I started out as a teacher, and yet I still consider myself a teacher, too, mm -hmm. in, in so many ways. You're, yes, you're teaching along with your coaching and mentoring. Um, you also set an example and uh, encourage your players to give back to the community. I think that's, uh, uh, many people might not know about that. Talk about that. It's one of the hardest things in our profession, I believe, and for the young students too, is to keep balance in your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we want to recognize is one of the core values of the university is the community. And so it's important that the university be an extension to the community and that we enrich the community because the community certainly enriches our life. Mm -hmm. and. So what we do with our students is look for opportunities. All of women's athletics does this. I'm sure the men's athletic program does as well, is to look for opportunities to engage our students in opportunities to serve the community, to get to know people better. Uh, we work with the hospital. We work with Ronald McDonald, uh, Habitat for Humanity. There are a number of projects that we take on. On our spring break, which is a long trip, we always make a special project in the city that we happen to be in, which is the last number, last seven years has been Sacramento. Really? And last year we went to the uh, Shriners Hospital and spent a really nice day with the young kids that were in the program there. And it's, it just puts good balance, not only in my life, but mm -hmm. in my students' lives too. And I think it helps us to appreciate that health may be the greatest gift we've ever been given. And I wonder if those players that are now coaches, if they've incorporated that in their, uh, to give back to the community wherever they are. See what you've started? Well, I, I know a number of them have, and again, it's just becoming aware of needs that exist around us and realizing that there are lots of other things around us that are far greater than our practice and our competition. That's wonderful. I, tell me about this capital campaign for the softball complex. You must be thrilled about that, too. I'm ecstatic about it. It's, it's going to be uh, moving to its final stage for building, actually within the next 
two, three weeks mm -hmm. and all the way through the winter time. But we've got the first phase in, which is the grandstand seating and the lights are in. What is wonderful, Ellen, about the whole process is there have been so many people who have responded to help us, many who I've never personally met mm -hmm. and yet have had the great pleasure of corresponding with and, and letting them know how much we really appreciate what they've done for us. Um, if there's anything that is unique to Iowa, Iowa is the kind of community that can do a project like this and have so many people involved. And um, I am I'm blessed to have been a part of it, to have been the first campaign for women's mm -hmm. athletics, but to have had the chance to meet all the people that I've met has been a special reward the last year. And what happened? You had a big celebration when you turned on the lights for the first time yes, last we did. spring? Yes, and we even got a lot of cooperation on the weather that day, which was <laughs> real fun. Um, we played in April, late uh -huh. April, and turned on the lights, and Joe Crookham from Musco, our, the CEO, came over, who was the gentleman who gave us the gift and kind mm -hmm. from Musco Lighting, and uh, brought probably 100 of his community people, his, his uh, business people, mm -hmm. with him, his family, and it was re really fun, and I, Joe told me afterwards he, he got so many pats on the back that night from the <laughs> Iowa City people and the people that came to the game for thanking him personally uh -huh. for the gift to the program. But it was, it was very, very fun. I'm, I'm a fairly intense coach when I'm coaching, and yet I can honestly tell you that night I had a hard time concentrating because I was so caught up with looking at the lights every time I stepped out of the dugout. <laughs> but it was a fun memory. It's something we'll remember for a long time, and it was a neat thing to share with mm. the community. So you've, that's your first phase. What's the next phase of that? What, we, what we're doing now, and we'll start in October and be completed by the next spring, is actually building underneath the existing grandstand seating and onto the back of our present dugout. So we will have team locker rooms mm -hmm. at the field, which we've never had. Uh, much, much nicer arrangement of public restrooms, which is always helpful in mm -hmm. a community project. Uh, concessions and, a, and a, just a great press box area for, uh, for all the people who will be working the game. So we're, we're thrilled with that. That's, in, um, that's just incredible progress in our program. How, I'm just curious, how long do your young women practice? What, um, what's kind of a commitment do they make? Uh, they make quite a big commitment, and I, I think a lot of times it's, it's a lot more than people realize. In the fall, this is our non-traditional season, they're practicing Monday through Friday for two and a half hours each day. And uh, we just finished a competition this weekend, so they spent Saturday and Sunday playing. They're off today, but they'll jump back into a, a cycle on Tuesday. In the winter time, they're training um, uh, a limited number of hours inside with the actual sport, a couple hours a week on that, but they do a lot of strength training and conditioning during that segment of time. And then as soon as we come back from the Christmas break, we swing right back into full practice again, indoors, and open our season in February. And then how many games about in a season? Do you uh, roughly, well, 56 is the actual number, but by the time we play our, our tournament, it's probably closer to 65 games. Other than studies, I don't think they probably have much time to they, do anything. They else. do curtail some other <laughs> activities, I can assure you, especially during the season. And that's why we try to make that fall um, a, a semester of adjustment, for, mm -hmm. especially for new students, with more time and more opportunity for other activities. But yes, uh, I think it's important for people to understand that our student athletes make quite a commitment in their time. And you've had a wonderful record, uh, the women athletes, in graduating. Yes. Yes, we've done quite well there. Um, I can tell you that in the time I've been here and, and the students who have stayed with us and finished their eligibility, we've had one senior not graduate in 12 years. This will be the start of my, my 12th season. Uh, I prefer not to be able to tell you that we had anyone who didn't, but uh -huh. it's, a, it's a real nice statement that the young women in our program understand how important their academics are and, mm -hmm. and that that's the door that's opening for them once they graduate. Mm, that's wonderful. When you aren't coaching and mm -hmm. mentoring and administrating and teaching, what do you like to do? To, I mean, how do you unwind? What do you do to kind of kick back and? <clears throat> well, if I have time in Iowa City, mm -hmm. um, if it's the summertime, I love to spend some time at the, the lake. I happen to have a boat, and that's a fun activity for me. Uh, on Lake McBride? Uh, at Coralville. Uh, oh, the Coralville. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a ski boat, so that's uh -huh. something that's kind of a nice, fun little social activity with some friends. If I have enough time where I can get out of town, um, I have a good friend that has a lake cottage, and that's, a, that's my escape. A hotel is the last place mm -hmm. I want to be. You want to be by water, yes, it sounds like. Yes, water and, you know, no phones mm -hmm. and 
and maybe even have to walk into town to get a newspaper. You know, just take a lot of reading material mm -hmm. with you and enjoy the solitude and the quiet. Mm -hmm. When I have a chance to get home, that's a real, real high priority. My family is, is uh, a, a very, very important part of my life. And uh, my job probably makes that a little harder with being a good eight hours away. Mm -hmm. uh, but Thanksgiving is their time and Christmas is their time. And we spend a lovely uh, weekend at a Lake Cottage together too. A very small little cottage with 25 bodies packed inside of it, but it's you it's, are a close family. Well, you know what? It's it's the highlight of our summers. No matter oh, where we've traveled and where we've been, it's the highlight. Oh. So when you read for pleasure, what kind of books do you like to read? I, I really like to read uh, biographies more than anything else. I like to read about people that have overcome adversity and mm -hmm. um, and ha have been very successful people and. Uh, Robert Schuller is one of the people that I, I think has probably set, um, has had a major impact on my life and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his, his, uh, his program with the Hour of Power and the Power of Positive Thinking and whatnot. I, I try to work very hard to make certain that that's how I lead my life and, and run my life on a professional as well as a personal mm -hmm. level. And, but I really enjoy reading about people overcoming great adversities and, uh, you know, those are some of the things I, that I think impact how I try to choose to lead my own personal life. So those are always by your bedside. <laughs> I, have a, I have a floor that probably needs to be fixed up every once in a while, but <laughs> there are a number of things that are laying there that are, are real fun to read at night, yes. When you talk to your uh, recruits or you talk to your parents or somebody, what do you tell them, what do you like best about living in Iowa City? Um, I, I love the people. Um, you can't be in the kind of work that we're in and not really love people. And I've lived in the last 20 some years of my life, I've lived in college towns and I like the environment of a college town. There's something about being in the midst of 30 some thousand <laughs> young people that really keeps things different than mm -hmm. if you're not in that kind of environment. And the people have been so supportive here. Um, honestly, I could probably enjoy weather a little further south than <laughs> Iowa, but it's all the things that I've gained from the standpoint of relationships and friendships mm -hmm. and people that I've gained, had the opportunity to get to know. That's the number one thing for me in Iowa City. And has, have the 11 years gone just swiftly? Well, when I think about starting my 12th season, yes, 12th season. they have. Especially again with the reunion this weekend, and we talked about that. And yeah, what's, what were some of the highlights of this reunion? That's that's wonderful. Twenty-five year reunion. Yes, it was. I, I said there was probably only one thing I wish could have been done differently, and that would have been for all of our athletes to have been at the banquet on uh, to hear on the, Saturday night to hear to the hear, stories to hear the stories and to see the history that was shared. Mm -hmm. It would have been appropriate for all the young women that are presently in the program. Because I think the one thing that I struggle with is wanting my students to have perspective on how much better things are now for women. Certainly we have progress to make and we'll mm -hmm. continue to work on that and Christine works on that every day. We all do. But we have still made incredible progress. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. The banquet was wonderful. Four different uh, women had the chance to share different periods of the development of women's athletics with the whole of the banquet. Mm -hmm. And it was just incredible to hear these women speak in terms of what athletics had meant to them in their lives and how it had impacted their lives today mm -hmm. and what it was like to be around wonderful mentors such as Christine Grant, Bonnie Slatton, Peg Burke, uh, you know, just a number of people who were instrumental in terms of the development of this program. You've come a long way. That we have. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'll end it on that positive note. And Gail, thank you for being a guest on my program. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. My guest on One of a Kind has been Gail Blevins, a University of Iowa women's softball coach. For 11 years as a head coach, she and her teams have had remarkable successes. With encouragement and enthusiasm, Gail motivates her players to be all they can be on and off the field. She and her staff encourages the young players to remember that success is a journey. As a coach, she builds a team concept recruits talented kids who have heart and desire. Talent, heart, and desire. That describes Gail Blevins. Gail Blevins is one of a kind. Mm -hmm.